Many people misunderstand what Isaiah 53, this prophecy, what it really means. When you look at the prophecy, and yes, it is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, about his suffering, about his crucifixion. The interesting thing is this prophecy is not to Gentiles, but it's actually for Israel. And even more of note is when this prophecy is to be realized and understood. So for more to see what I'm talking about, let's go to Isaiah 53 and let's read it. And we're going to discover something interesting and we've got to figure out why is it written this way. So in 53, you're going to see something interesting immediately. He says, who has believed our message? Well, hearing this, if this is about Jesus, what message? And then notice what you're going to start seeing is the past tense verb used in a lot of these verbs. So who has believed our message? Or some versions might say who has believed our report. Before we go any further, you need to understand that this passage is also brought up, quoted, by Paul in Romans chapter 10. We'll get to that in just a little bit, but back to it. He says, who has believed our report or our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. And here we're going to see a lot of these verbs that are in the past tense. He was despised and forsaken, past tense, for, of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. So again, there is this past tense to the verb. And so why would this prophecy about Jesus who has, who has not yet been born, who has not been crucified, who has not died, who has not been resurrected, why would this prophecy looking forward to the future use past tense. Continuing in verse four, surely our griefs he himself bore. Again, past tense. This is beginning, if you think about it, it can probably be a little bit confusing. Well, here's the reason why, because this particular passage is not written to Gentiles. Now, Gentiles can glean from this, but this is written to Israel. Before we speak on that, I want to go ahead and put this, this chart up, this graph up, this, this uh, picture up, to show you really who is writing, obviously Isaiah, but when and why and where. Notice in the bottom right-hand corner, you see the prophets and you see when they were writing, under what conditions. Isaiah is a prophet to the southern kingdom, and really this applies to all of Israel, but his prophecy is to speak about what is going to come. They are getting ready to go into exile, and you're going to see all these different prophecies that these prophets to the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom give pertaining to Israel being brought back in. Remember, Israel is a not only dysfunctional, but a disobedient nation. But God still has a plan for Israel. God is not going to forget about Israel. To understand what he is doing with Israel and why he's doing so, remember, they made him jealous for going after other gods. And so in Exodus 32, he says that I'm going to make you jealous. And we know he's going to make him jealous with the people who are not a people. He's going to call people who are not his people, someone who was not loved by him and make them beloved to do what? To make him jealous of them. That's going to be the Gentiles. And then in Jeremiah 31, he speaks about this new covenant, this covenant that they broke, that Israel broke with him, that he didn't break. But what is he going to do with them? He's going to make a new covenant with the Jews, unlike the covenant that they made with their fathers. He says in 32, it won't be like the covenant which I made with their fathers in that day that I took them out, of the, out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now, it's important to know what he is going to do in this covenant that God is going to make in this covenant. This is not a conditional covenant. This is, this is an unconditional covenant. And God is thus saying what he is going to do unconditioned by the Jews this is what God is going to do. He states in verse 30 through in the middle, he says, I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again. Each man, his neighbor, each man, his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will, <clears throat> and their sin I will remember no more. This is about Israel and what he's going to do. If we think about it, this has not happened yet, at least not fully. There may have been, there are some Jews who have come to know Jesus as their Messiah, but by and large, they have not. 
particularly the nation of Israel. Now also pay attention to what he's saying about the nation in general as a whole that he is going to do with them. In verse 35, he says, thus the Lord who gives light, who gives sun for the light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. So he's speaking of these things that he's done and look what he, how he compares. Look what he says. He says, if this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, they're still there. His point is Israel will always be a nation before the Lord forever. So his point is he is going to bring Israel back, which is what he's always stated, that Israel, a disobedient nation, he is going to bring them back. That takes us to Isaiah, back to Isaiah 53. And so what's going to happen is after he has dealt with the Gentiles, then he is going to turn his attention to Israel, which is why we see this past tense. As a matter of fact, before we go there, let's go back. Let's go to Romans, Romans 10, Paul 9, 10 and 11. Paul is speaking about Israel, how he could wish that he himself could be a curse for his countrymen, for the Jews, for Israel, physical Jews, not some sort of spiritual Israel, which the Bible doesn't speak of, but actual Jews, because by and large, they are not coming to Christ. And Paul is bothered by that. And then we get to chapter 10, verse 1. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation, for Israel to return or to come to their Messiah. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For not for knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The problem is Israel is not believing. And so what is he going to do for Israel? Well, he's going to bring them back. But when is he going to bring them back? And this is going to bring us to an understanding of Isaiah 53. He will do so as he says, let's go to chapter 11 and let's start in verse 25. He says, I do not want you brethren to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Now, what's the mystery? The mystery is kind of twofold. The Gentiles are coming into Christ, but now the Jews are not. He says, he says this, he says that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. How long? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so this partial hardening will last until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So what is the fullness of the Gentiles in? That is apparently some number allotted, some, some finality of the Gentiles, God having his focus on them, bringing them in. What's the exact number? Don't know. When will that be? We do not know. But when the fullness of the Gentiles has come, then Paul tells us that he will turn his attention to Israel. And look what he says. He quotes, uh, let's go to verse 26. He says, and, and so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. And so he's quoting who? He's quoting Isaiah. If you look throughout Romans, Paul quotes Isaiah an awful lot. He says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. That's going to happen. That has not happened yet. He is going to remove ungodliness from Israel. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So he's going to do so. It just hasn't happened yet. This spirit of stupor that he stated, that Paul states, has happened to Israel. Why? Because he's dealing with the Gentiles. Now, in Romans 10, and we won't go over it, but Paul is, again, he goes through actually quoting Isaiah 53 when speaking about salvation for these Jews. But he says, how shall they hear unless a preacher be sent? How shall they hear unless someone tells him? Well, the interesting twist is that the Gentiles are now going to be the ones that are going to be taking the gospel to these Jews. And then he quotes Isaiah 53, again, where it says, whose report shall we believe? So let's go back to Isaiah 53 and let's see what he says. Verse four, uh, again, we're looking at it from the, from the end. Why is that? Because when God actually works in Israel, this is going to be part of, without going too far into it, this is going to be part of a fulfillment of the Daniel 9 prophecy, these 70 weeks or these 77s that have been prophesied. The last seven, which has not happened yet, he is going to deal with Israel. Midway through the intensity of this seven-year tribulation is going to be turned up, and then Israel is going to be dealt with harshly. And what will Israel say? This is where this prophecy comes in, this Isaiah 
53 prophecy is going to come in. That's why we use the past tense. That's why the prophecy is in the past tense. Why? Because Israel will look back on what has happened and they will say, oh, he was despised. He was bruised. He, verse four, he, he surely has, uh, surely our griefs, he has bore, past tense, and our sorrows he carried, past tense, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. In other words, we crucified him, smitten of God and afflicted, past tense, but he was pierced through for our transgression. Other versions might say, but he was wounded, past tense. He was wounded or pierced through for our transgressions, past tense. He was crushed or bruised, past tense, for our iniquity. This is what Israel is going to be saying in that day, looking back to what happened in the cross. They know the stories and God will touch their hearts much the same way, actually the same way that he did with the Gentiles. And he says, the chastisement of for our well-being fell, past tense, upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Now, some are going to say, well, what this is referring to is a physical healing. It is not referring to a physical healing, though physical healing did occur. If we go to Matthew 8, what we're going to see is we're going to see people being healed. And I understand from this, people will say, well, then this particular verse in Isaiah is speaking of people being physically healed. That's not what's happening here. He's going to re reference them. Why? Because these Jews in the past are going to be able to look back and see this is what happened then. So let's go to chapter eight. This is after Peter's mother-in-law who was sick, Jesus heals. And then in verse 17, I'm sorry, let's go to verse 16. When evening came, chapter eight, verse 16, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out spirits with the word and healed those who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. So again, this is to be spoken of Isaiah. And again, the past tense are going to be used. Why? Because the Jews in that day, when God afflicts them and then touches their heart, they will look back and they'll say, you know what? He did heal people. He did bear people's infirmities and he was bruised. He was crushed for our, all these past tense verbs are going to make sense when they say so. Notice, notice how Peter puts it in first Peter uh, chapter two, verse 24. He says, and he, that's Jesus, obviously himself bore past tense, our sins in his body on the cross. He's referring, he's, he's partially quoting Isaiah 53 on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We know he's speaking about Israel because it says for by his wounds, we were healed for you were continually straying like sheep. That's not the Gentiles. That is the Jews. That's Israel continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and guarding of your soul. So he's speaking now in this case, he's speaking to these Jews who have been scattered abroad. But the point of Isaiah, uh, but the point of Isaiah 53 is to convey this prophecy that they will look back at a certain time, at a certain point, we don't know when, and repeat these words. All of Israel, at least those who God will save. Not all of Israel will be saved. Not every single person of the nation is going to be saved. We find that out because Paul says so, but he, he is going to deal with that particular nation, the focal point of the tribulation. Others also will also find salvation during the tribulation, but the focal point will be Israel and they will look back and they will make this statement. So I hope that this has helped. I hope this gives you a, a clear picture of what Isaiah 53 is for now. Does that mean that we can't glean as Gentiles anything from Isaiah 53? No, we absolutely can because we already appreciate that, or at least we should. Hopefully we appreciate what was done, but he is still going to because he says Israel will always continue to be a nation before him. And so he, after he finishes showering love on us, which is a wonderful thing, he is then going to turn his attention back to Israel and then he'll take two and make it into one flock where he will be the shepherd forever. Amen.